Am I allowed to sit next yes, to you please. and ask you some questions? Yes, of course. Thank you. Salutations, Venerable Sir. Good morning. Good morning. Am I allowed to ask you a couple of questions, sir? You can ask as many as you like. Yeah. Thank oh. you, sir. Mm. I have uh, the privilege of having uh, Ajahn Jai Sir, who is my guest today. He is a, a monk in the Theravada forest tradition, Thai forest tradition. And uh, he has been traveling all over the world, making people understand how to understand and view uh, Buddhist practices. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining me on the show. Yes, you're welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. So one of the questions that struck me when you were talking right now is a very simple question. What is the difference between a Buddhist monk and the rest of the world? Well, I, um, the Buddha envisaged uh, Buddhist society um, as composed of four groups male monastics, female monastics, male householders, and female householders. And he said on a number of occasions that there are no special esoteric teachings reserved only for the monastics. So the teaching is the same whether you are a monastic or a non-monastic. But the Buddha didn't only teach the Dhamma, he taught what he called the Dhamma Vinaya. And Vinaya is a word that, that some Buddhists maybe will be familiar with um, in reference to the monastic code of discipline. But its meaning is, is wider than that, broader than that. And it refers to all the ways in which we try to adjust and um, set up the conditions, external conditions, in a way which are most conducive to progress in Dhamma. So the Buddha wasn't only talking about the inner world and meditation, but uh, recognizing that the society we live in, its values, the, the, um, uh, the conventions and laws and so on, uh, have a serious impact on how we live our lives um, and that we need to take that into consideration also. So Vinaya means that all the, um, the tools that we have at our disposal uh, to create a situation, a, a family, a community, a culture which reflects Buddhist values and supports the practice of, of Dhamma. Um, so in the world at large, it may be um, laws and regulations, conventions, customs, um, agreements, uh, and so on. All the different ways in which we can come together and decide, well, we'll do it like this rather than like that. So in the world, of course, with so many uh, different um, groups with different interests and different values, um, one's ability to create um, a, an environment which is conducive to Buddhist practice is limited. But the Buddha was able to design um, a structure um, and then what we call the, the monastic code of discipline, the Vinaya, um, aimed specifically at minimizing all the obstacles to the practice of the Eightfold Path and maximizing all of the supporting conditions. So monks, are monastics, are, are people who voluntarily um, have, feel such a strong commitment to the Eightfold Path that they uh, want to enter the Sangha and take advantage of these supportive conditions for the practice, uh, study, practice and propagation of the Dhamma. Uh, what propels, what makes uh, people opt to be a monk? Uh, is, it a, is it necessary that suffering or dukkha of some kind is a, a necessity to start looking inwards or uh, are there other factors at play? How do you look at it? Well, if we look at um, a Buddhist country 
like Thailand today, there's a, um, there's a wide variety of, of motivations. Um, firstly, that the specific feature of Thai Buddhism, which is the Buddhism, of course, I'm, I'm familiar with, um, is that temporary ordination is the norm. And that most, monk, most uh, people who become monks become monks for a limited period. And for uh, hundreds of years, um, it is a, like a rite of passage for young men. After they finish their education, before they get married, before they uh, begin their careers, they will spend three months of the monsoon series, uh, season, the wasa, as a bhikkhu, uh, as a monk. And this would be considered to ground them in moral, ethical values, spiritual values, which would enable them to live the life as a Buddhist householder in the best possible way. So that's always been a feature of, of Thai Buddhism, that you have a lot of monks who are there for shorter periods of time. It's also in, in Thai culture um, the uh, most favored way for, um, we're talking about young men here, to show their appreciation of the debt of gratitude they owe to their parents. So if you, sometimes you ask a young monk, he's not necessarily any great um, uh, drive to realize Nibbana, but he said, oh yes, I want to become a monk to make merit for my parents. This is a very, very common um, motivation these days. You also have um, um, people who maybe take temporary ordination when they're young, and then they, um, they leave, they, they have a family, um, they put their children through college, and then maybe in their 60s after retirement, they return to the Sangha uh, <coughs> with a desire to spend their, their last years um, as monks and fully devote themselves to, to the Dhamma. In, in Thailand, at least, if someone who has um, already married um, had lived life as a householder, um, if they wish to become a monk, they have to have permission from their wife if they're still married. So if someone is um, running out on difficulties um, at home, and, and then you, d you really don't want that kind of person because um, they tend to cause a lot of problems in the monasteries. If that, that kind of immaturity then before very long starts to express itself <laughs> in the monastery. Um, so that's one, I think, misunderstanding that people think, you know, that um, becoming a monk is a way of sort of escaping from the real world, as it were. I think as, as someone who's lev lived this life for over 40, almost 50 years, I would say that it's quite the opposite, that um, certainly in the, in the forest monasteries, you are confronted with yourself. You have to um, learn how to live with yourself without all of the distractions of modern life. Um, you can't run away from your feelings and your, your mental states uh, through eating or entertainments or you're putting yourself on the spot. And the life is quite a, a rigorous one that we, the day begins at 3 a.m. Um, and usually 10 a.m., 10 p.m. before it ends, and um, it's a lot of uh, hard physical work often, as well as uh, meditation. And so it's not for someone who just wants to have an easy life, that's for sure. So in, uh, in Thailand, of a, the monastic order, I think maybe 300,000, something like that, 200 to 300,000 people, monks, nuns, um, monks and novices. I, I would say less than 10% are ordaining with the motivation you find in the Tipitaka to follow the path to ultimate liberation. I have a lot of the monastic order split into, into two camps right from the time of the Buddha. We have the monks who are living in the forests and living quite an ascetic life and whose lives are 
based um, predominantly on meditation. Whereas the monks in cities and towns and villages, they often have more like priestly functions, performing ceremonies for the local people and providing the, the sort of the moral and spiritual heart of the uh, of the life of the of the society and and I think sometimes in in Thailand the forest monks get a little bit kind of arrogant even you know we're the real monks and they're just you know like career monks or some but something that I often now say to younger monks who say things like that is you know it's because of these monks that Buddhism is still alive today you know, if we're all off in the forest and we only ever see people on arms round and, and just then um, I think Buddhism would just be kind of like uh, just for the elites these days. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it is so still so much embedded in the culture is because of this, uh, the monasteries in the towns and villages which become the center of the social and cultural life of the community. Uh, you mentioned that a uh, lot of people opt for the temporary kind of ordination. Yes. Uh, in your experience, have you uh, met enough numbers to give you any indication of there are any lasting character changes that happen, any moral code that is really picked up, or is it one more tradition like many other religions of the world may have different uh, varied views about it, but how do you see it? Yes, um, I don't have the data, of course, you know, and and, um, and it's going to vary from from person to person. True. So, I mean, you know, just a, one or two observations is that this custom of ordaining, becoming monk for the three months of the rainy season, is very suited to an agrarian society where you plant you plant your seeds and you. And then you have a period during the rainy season when the rain's coming down. You don't. There's not very much work in the fields, um, and then you you come out from monkhood in time for the harvest. So it's not uh, having a negative impact on the on the family uh, finances or economy. Also, the uh, if you are a civil servant in Thailand, you can uh, request a three-month paid leave to become a monk once in your career. So that's the way that the, the society supports that. But as the shift um, towards uh, um, a modern industrial um, capitalist economy uh, has gathered speed, more and more people living in the cities and taking three, three months um, off to become a monk uh, is less and less practical and uh, people say, oh, I'd like to do it, but I just lose my job. And then, you know, when I get back, you know, how am I going to take care of my family? Uh, so the, the tendency has been for shorter and shorter periods of temporary ordination, like uh, as short as one week or two weeks. And so the, obviously um, the, the benefits um, are, are not great in that, in that case. I, I would say even... So, with the shorter ordination, the, the value to the individual and their spiritual welfare is, is probably not so great. But in terms of, big picture, in terms of maintaining that sense of um, uh, warmth and connection between the, monast the monasteries and the lay community, um, that still holds true. Because it, certainly when you're up country, everyone is either is, um, was a monk or has a, a brother or an uncle or a father was a monk at some time. And if someone becomes a monk, then the whole family want to go and make merit. And so they're going to the monastery and listening to, to Dhamma teachings in a way that they wouldn't otherwise in many cases. Um, so apart from the, the motivations of, of the monks, uh, of the temporary ordinees and their, um, their, their restrictions um, through their financial and economic situation, the other thing is, of course, the quality of the monastery and the training that they get. Um, so some, some people uh, become monks and become really disillusioned 
as they go to monasteries and uh, now rather than just seeing the monks in public where they'll seem kind of very restrained and it's like oh now you're on the inside and then sometimes it can be really uh, quite disillusioning so there, there's there's that also um, other monk other people um, feel it's like the most important uh, thing that ever happened in their life and they go back to visit their monastery um, on regular occasions and feel a real um, connection to the abbot or their teacher. So it's, it's kind of really varied, I would say. Okay, so one question that cuts across both the monks and the lay people in that sense. If you had to restrict yourself to um, name one quality of dukkha or understanding of dukkha or something, what is it that becomes the trigger point for anybody to genuinely walk within? Yes, thank you. I, in fact, I, I didn't answer the, the, the you answered that, asked that question just now, so I'll go back to that a little bit. Um, and the understanding of, of, of dukkha, because that's obviously the, um, you know, the key teaching that we're in the Four yeah. Noble Truths, the heart of Buddhism, as it were. I um, think that, that, first of all, every, every translator who meets this word just throws up their hands and say, how can we translate this word? Because it's, it's a unique word. And in fact, the only person who, the only people who really understand what that word means are arahants. Oh. It's not possible. That's what enlightenment means. You understand what dukkha is. So, so we have to start off with this you know, recognition. You, you can't understand it. Um, but and also there is a difference between the way this word is used in different contexts and most specifically in the three characteristics of existence anicchang, dukkang, anatta and dukkha as the first of the four noble truths so there, here also there is often a lot of confusion because people don't recognize that this word, this word is used in a different way so I, I would give um, the broadest um, definition here is dukkha means not nibbana. Okay. okay, so we say everything is dukkha. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you're let's say taking like a miserable uh, view of existence. It means uh, that's in comparison to nibbana. Everything is flawed to one degree or another compared with nibbana. Um, also, there is um, a, a saying of the Buddha, um, again very important, which is often overlooked, is that uh, Nibbana is the highest, most the supreme kind of happiness. So this is the happiness um, without defilement. So, the, so in understanding Dukkha in the Four Noble Truths, we're saying that this is not a, um, a denial of worldly happiness. Okay. Um, but it's saying that worldly happiness is always conditioned, contingent, flawed to one extent, degree or another, and is inseparable from various forms of unhappiness. So. Um, it's looking at the, the whole picture. Let, let, to give you um, an example, let's say you have a, a desire for some sensory pleasure and um, you, are, you are successful and you enjoy that sensory pleasure. Okay, so in, the, in talking about sensory pleasures, most people will focus um, almost exclusively on the, um, the peak experience of pleasure from that experience. But as Buddhists we're looking at the whole process from the very first moment that you have this, the desire arises in your mind. So if the desire arises for a sensory pleasure it means that there is a sense of lack. It means that you're not happy with how things are right now because you think that sensory pleasure will improve 
So your, be your beginning point is this is an aspect of dukkha, a sense of lack, something not quite right, something that needs something else to make it better. True. Um, and then with the, the search for that object, then um, if it's not immediately available, then you may run into um, various kinds of stress and tension of, Am I going to get this or not? What will happen if I don't? And the way that you look at other people changes in that um, now you're looking at people as competitors um, or people to use in order to get what you want. So various kinds of unwholesome dhammas will arise very easily in the mind of someone who's intent on a sensory pleasure. And often one's commitment to moral standards is compromised because um, if there's a shortcut to get this thing that you want, then often if the desire is strong enough, then many people be willing to um, take that shortcut, which might be um, dishonesty, taking advantage of other people. Now eventually, let's say you're successful and you, you experience this pleasure, um, but if you look really closely, the, the, the most intense pleasure is to one degree or another simply the release of tension that you accumulated in the search for it. And the next observation is our bodies and minds are unable to sustain sensory pleasure for any length of time. We get tired, we get hungry, we get thirsty, or we, you know, we, our body has its, its needs and its demands and even if let's say you were, you were a lover of fine art and you were able by some miracle to be able to procure the Mona Lisa or the, the, the painting considered the most beautiful and you were to put it on the wall here and you sit, how long could you enjoy the Mona Lisa before you got bored? You know, even the most you know, refined sensory pleasure and how much of the pleasure of that is actually a secondary kind of pleasure. What well, I've got something that other people don't want. People are going to be so jealous of me. I'm going to be so famous that I've got this. So these are secondary and, and less pure pleasures than the, the original. And then how can I hold on to this? How can I protect it? Um, and then eventually, of course, at one point, there's separation. So if we, we're not taking like a puritanical view of sense pleasure, we're saying, let's look at this more closely. What's really going on here? Like from the moment that you, you form a desire, the, the, the uh, enjoyment of the pleasure, until the eventual the separation from it. And so your, your view towards it shifts. So then we're seeing, overall, this is a dukkha phenomena. You know, that when you add up, all of the, the stress, the tension, the, the arising of unwholesome dhammas and so on and so forth and weigh it up against the pleasure. Actually it doesn't, you know, the, the pleasure you, most often doesn't really you know, add up. So it, it's more a sense of seeing things in context and looking at things and being willing to look at things more, more closely and how they impact other areas of your life and the quality of your life. Um, and again, why, why ordinary pleasures and happiness, as most people would know it, is considered within the realm of, of dukkha is because it eats up resources. Yeah. You know, whether it's, not, whether it's financial resources um, or physical resources, time. You spend a lot of time on these things and at the end, what you get from them, not very much. So again, only when you have a spiritual goal does, um, can you see the drawback in that kind of everyday happiness. Again, it's not just saying it's bad, it's evil, but saying the more time and effort and interest, um, obsession even, you, then the less time you have for developing yourself spiritually. So you're still, you're still, it's a trade-off. You may not think it's a trade-off, 
Um, but it is because you're shutting yourself off from some wonderful experiences that human beings are capable of realizing um, because it's like you're on uh, let, let's say a building of many stories and you're on you're on the bottom floor you say oh it's really nice it's nice we've got air conditioning we've got nice furniture and, and, and it's got a nice quiet. yes but as long as you're on the first floor uh, that means you can never know what's on the second, third, fourth, fifth floor. So if you're, you know, that's okay if that's what you want, but you should recognize that there is more to life than this and that you are um, preventing yourself from having any opportunity to access those more profound dimensions of human experience through that obsession with the very easily accessible sensual pleasures. Can you tell us what prompted you to become a monk? I would make is that, again, re regarding the experience of, of dukkha, and people assume that must be, oh, you have some you know, great pain in your life and you sort of give up on life and become a monk, that, that kind of idea, which is not a very accurate one. I would say. I would like to, if I may, just take my own life as an example in that um, I had a very um, good upbringing. My parents uh, looked, uh, brought me up very well and I was, um, I had a lot of illness, uh, asthma as a child, but that wasn't really um, a major factor. It was in the sense that um, I can remember as a boy one particular event. I, I, I would have real difficulty breathing late at night or not so late. And it's like every in-breath is like climbing a mountain, you know. And, it, and then you get to the top and, and then you have to start again and climb the next mountain. And I, I just wanted to call my parents in, um, not because they could do anything, but just to have that them close. And then at that moment they were watching television in the next room and I heard them laughing. And I thought, no, I don't want to, to, to bother them. And then, then I thought, you know, when you're really suffering like this, nobody can help you. They, they can't really. What, can I, what do I want them to do? You know? and, and so this sense that in the really important, critical, events in your life, you have to know how to look after yourself. So I'm not, I don't think I was that articulate at eight years old or nine years old, but that was the underlying kind of idea that came to me through physical suffering as a child. Um, and as I, uh, I, I recovered, and I was always a very good, I think partly because I had asthma, I missed school a lot and became very studious and liked to read and study and think in ways that most boys of my age would not. So I, I really uh, um, I'm grateful to asthma for that. So when as a teenager, there are two questions that came up in my mind. It's like, one is, what's the best way to live your life as a human being? And secondly, um, the world seems so full of pain and suffering and, and uh, violence and injustice and cruelty. And does it have to be like this? Could the world be, in some way at least, better than it is right now? And what would that mean? And what responsibility do you have as just a single human being to try to make the world a better place? Is it possible? to do so, um, and if so, how could you do it? These, these are the kind of questions that I, I spent a lot of time thinking about and read a lot of books, and I didn't think this was a religious um, you know, inquiry because I thought I'd rejected Christianity when I was seven or eight years. It didn't make any sense to me. I had no sense of, I just didn't uh, compute, you know. Um, and so I, I was looking at works of philosophy and psychology and, and, and so on. And then I, I came across teachings of the Buddha and it's just been like absolutely, 
I say enlightened common sense, you know, not like some exotic Asian religion, but just, yeah, oh, of course, it's so clear. And, and so, in short, my conclusion was the practice of the Eightfold Path is the best way to live your life, you know, whether it's in whatever path of life or whatever profession or whatever, you know, but it should be based upon practice of the Eightfold Path. And secondly, that um, practicing the Eightfold Path and then sharing one's knowledge of it with others is the way that I feel I could contribute to the world to, in this small way to make the world a better place. Um, and it was only um, two or three years later, well, after I'd been to India and spent a year traveling around India and got back and really just took stock of you know, what I wanted to do with my life. And I found out that it was possible to become a monk in the forest in Thailand and that the monastic order was set up specifically for people like me. You know, so um, they, that's why I became a monk. So the sense of, of dukkha is not personal. You know, I, I, was, I was a very good scholar. I could have gone to... Oxford or Cambridge, if I wanted to, or, you know, top university. I had lots of friends. I, you know, by normal worldly standards, you know, I was doing okay. But I just felt this is empty and hollow, and and this is um, not really, you know, um, what I, I want to find. What is the best thing? So ambition, if you like. <laughs> what's the best way to live your life, and and what what's the best that you can do for others? Yeah.